Hi folks, you know, um, just, just a fantastic venue, isn't it? I, when I was first asked to speak here, I telephoned a friend of mine who was here last year at the Do Lectures, and I wanted to ask him what made the Do Lectures really special for him. And he thought for a moment, and then he said to me, he said, well, they are intense. <laughs> I know what he means now. But, you know, I'm, I've been looking at this tent uh, whilst Jeff uh, was, uh, we were watching Jeff's Doodles and, and David, and I was looking at the tent as well, and it's a great tent, and I'm really pleased. I'm really pleased that the Do Lectures are taking place under canvas. And the reason I'm really pleased is that over the last 20 years, I've had the good fortune to participate in lots of different expeditions to places all around the world. And, of course, one of the things that binds all of my expedition experiences together is that they've taken place under canvas. And I don't know whether it's the fact that I've camped in some beautiful places, certainly not the fact that I've ever camped with any beautiful people, but there's, <laughs> there is something about the conversations that take place under canvas that make them not only more intimate, but also more honest than many of the conversations that take place in buildings made from bricks and mortar. And over the years, what I've found is that those conversations have had not only a longer lasting, but also a more positive impact on my life. And for that reason, I'm really pleased. I'm really pleased that the Do Lectures are taking place in this fabulous tent. And the conversation I would like to have with you this afternoon revolves around some of the stories that we tell ourselves that sometimes get in the way of us doing the things we really want to do. I'm really passionate and fascinated by learning what drives other people. And when I meet someone who has a passion or an idea, but they're not pursuing it, I am always tempted to ask them why. And over the years, I've had lots of different answers to that question. But you can broadly summarise them into three distinct groups. And the first group of answers surround the person feeling they don't have enough time or they don't have enough money. And the second group of answers I get is the person thinks, I'm, I'm too young or I'm too inexperienced of any age. And the third group of answers I get revolve around that person having had conversations about their ideas with people around them and those people saying with the best will in the world and thinking of that person saying look better to take the path more traveled better to stick to what you really know i actually think there's a fourth reason but it's, it's actually a bit embarrassing and we don't like to talk about it so much luckily humor cloud has drawn the reason for us and it looks like this These, then, I think, are the reasons, the stories that we tell ourselves that sometimes stop us from doing what we really want to do. And what I'd like to do is share with you one story from one of my expeditions that challenges these reasons and, I believe, knocks them down. And in order to tell you this story, I need to take you back. I need to take you way back to October 1987. Now, just a quick straw poll. Who in the audience here was not yet on planet Earth in October 1987? There's a few of you. Middle age starts here for me then. <laughs> but for, for those of you who weren't here, and for those of us like me who can't actually remember October 1987 very well, three things to know about October 1987. One, the Bee Gees were at number one. <laughs> you don't know who the Bee Gees are, ask your parents. Two, after being promised a quiet night in by the Met Office, the southeast of England was devastated by a storm that blew across. It wreaked havoc in vast swathes of both rural and urban England. And the third thing about October 1987 is that Google... What the hell's Google? Well, that's October 1987. I was 17 years old. I was living at home. I was supposed to be studying for my A-levels to try and get into university. 
and I broke the habit of a lifetime in October 1987. That Sunday evening, I went to bed early. And I remember lying down on my bed, putting my head on the pillow, shutting my eyes and drifting off. And just as I was drifting off to sleep, my parents shouted up to me from downstairs. And they were shouting up to say that the British mountaineer Doug Scott was about to appear on national television news and they knew I was mad about mountains. Did I want to come down and see what Doug had to say? Extraordinary parents. Most parents of teenage children are trying to get their kids into bed in the evening. Oh, wonderful parents. I remember when I was younger, when I was much younger, I, I said to my dad, I said, Daddy, what do you really want me to do when I grow up? And he looked at me and said, leave home. <laughs> so I'm lying in bed and I couldn't be bothered because I was very tired. And when I was remembering this story, what worried me is what would I be doing now if I hadn't seized the spontaneous opportunity that my parents had given me? I wouldn't be standing here with the privilege of talking to you. That's, that's about as much as I know. I get up, go downstairs and Doug's on the television. And he's doing a story about all the rubbish that has accumulated at Everest Base Camp since the first ascent in 1953. And isn't it a terrible shame that this wonderful landscape is getting spoiled in this way? That was it. I yawned, went back upstairs and fell fast asleep. The next morning was a Monday morning. Normally I'd be going to school, but it was a holiday week. And so I'd put myself in to do some extra hours in the outdoor store that I had a part-time job in. It was a great job selling rucksacks and sleeping bags and tents, that kind of thing. And I turned up at 8 a.m. and the manager of the store, Barry Gridley, welcomed me at the entrance. And he says, Paul, he said, look sharp, look sharp today, Paul, he said, because we've got the managing director of the company, Nick Stephen, and he's coming in to see the staff. And at lunchtime, Nick got all the staff together downstairs in the basement staff room and he got us together to tell us about a club he was setting up that was going to combine adventure with conservation. Now remember, this is the late 1980s. The environmental movement as we know it now really hadn't got underway. The general public, the wider media, hadn't embraced it in the way that it has now. So in some respects, Nick's idea was a bit of a radical step. And when Nick had finished explaining the ethos of the club to the staff members, he then asked us, the members of staff, if we had any ideas for activities that the club could offer to the public to entice them to join and get involved. Now, with the exception of myself, Barry had assembled a stellar cast of employees to run this store. We had world-class survival instructors. We had people who used to be in the armed forces, we had a rock climbing instructor, we had top kayakers, and they're all coming up with ideas like mountaineering in the Alps or canoeing in Scotland. And I'm sitting there in the group and I'm joining the dots and suddenly a light bulb comes on in my head and inside I'm jumping up and down like Tigger because I know, I just know what expedition this club should do. But I've got a problem. I'm the Saturday boy. I'm the lowest point on the food chain. I can't say anything. Only the previous weekend I've been in the store, turned up for work, shop full of customers, member of staff on the other side of the store, shouted across, Oi, Deegan, can we borrow your brain? Quit building an idiot. I'm the butt of all jokes. If I say anything, I'm going to get shot down by these guys. In the end, I think, sod it, and I just start talking. And it all comes out about Doug, about Everest, about the rubbish, and about the fact that this club should go and sort it out. Well, instantly, of course, all of the members of the staff lay into me. Shut up, Deegan, they said, which was a bit of a mantra in the store at the time. <laughs> and then I look up, and Nick has turned like this beetroot colour. And I actually thought, I've blown it now. I've actually blown it. I've overstepped the mark. Because I hadn't put my hand up and said, excuse me, why don't we? I mean, what a crazy phrase. We use it in meetings all the time. You're inviting people to think of a reason you shouldn't do your idea before you've even told them it. Finally, Nick 
pops like a balloon and says, that's a great idea, he says. Take £100 out the till, go and research the idea and meet the club director. His name is John Barry. So I, I leave, the, leave the staff room and walk back up onto the shop. I didn't walk. I floated up onto the shop floor. And at that moment, I actually believed, I actually believed I was going to Mount Everest. Well, I never did take the £100, but I did do some homework. Looked into the environmental situation in Nepal, and I did go and meet John Barry. Now, John was a is a former commander of the Mountain and Arctic Warfare cadre of the Royal Marines and a former director of the National Centre for Mountain Activities up the road from here in North Wales. And when I met John, he was running a building and renovation company and he was on a job at a tower block in North London. Turned up after school one day with my head full of ideas and I remember I met John and he was in the living room of the basement flat that they were renovating. And all around the walls of the flat were all of his builders sitting on chairs. And John was wearing a black t-shirt and bright red tracksuit trousers. And they were talking about all the work they'd done that day and what they had to get done the next day. I waited my turn in the corner of the, of the room and finally John turns to me and asked me to share my idea with him. And I was really worried because he's a big name mountaineer and I figured he's going to take the idea, run with it, and I'm going to be either on the sidelines or worse, I'm going to be cut out of this idea completely. So I tell him all about it and then John does a really weird thing. He turned to the builders to ask them for their opinion on my idea. And I'm a bit peeved. I'm thinking, why is he asking the builders? I mean, I've done all the homework. What do builders know about cleaning up Mount Everest? But I remembered my manners and I kept, I, kept, I kept silent, didn't say a word. And luckily, the builders all seemed to think it was a good idea. So John turns back to me and says, right, Paul, he says, well, give it a go. But I'm off to climb K2 in winter. So you're going to have to start planning the expedition with the club secretary, Trudy Brown. Now, climbing K2 in winter is the mountaineering equivalent, I guess, of trying to push water uphill during a flash flood. And I thought, this is great. Suddenly, I think I'm going to be on the sidelines, and I've been put centre stage to try and plan it. Only problem was, I'd never planned an expedition, and um, neither had the club secretary. So we set to, and we started trying to work out what we should do, and firing off letters, and firing off faxes, and telephoning Nepal, and trying to make contacts, and getting the whole ball rolling. And It wasn't so much as trying to put a jigsaw puzzle together, as trying to find out where the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle were first, and then we could start to put them together. And when John got back from K2, we had a lucky break. And the lucky break we got was the media got hold of the story. And when the media got hold of the story, the BBC invited us onto national television news where they interviewed us about it. And it was that piece of media coverage, I think, more than all the others, that got the phones ringing off the hook. And in the end, we recruited more than 40 members of the public, everyone from students to civil servants. We had naval submariners and we had people in their retirement who all wanted to come together to do this thing for the environment. And shortly after I sat my A-levels, we set off for Nepal. However, John announced that, for various reasons, he was going to be unable to join the team for the first couple of weeks. So he put me in charge with the expedition doctor, Sandy Scott, to get the team to base camp where he would meet us. And those two weeks were like a, a crash course in project management. There's certain things you can plan for when you're organising the thing you want to do, and there's certain things you just don't know are going to happen, and you have to react instantly when they do. And we had a, a situation where we had three mountain flights to get everyone up to the little airstrip where we would start the trekking, and one of the flights was cancelled. Very naive, and I thought, well, that's no problem. The third lot of people will just fly tomorrow. But there was a two-week waiting list. Hundreds of people had had their flights cancelled. There was no chance of being able to start the expedition. We all got together and we worked hard together and we came up with this idea that meant that I needed to become instant best friends with the commander-in-chief of the Nepalese Army's Rotary Wing Command. 
which consisted of three helicopters at the time, and we persuaded him to fly us up to the airstrip on his first day off. And when we got to base camp, we had all kinds of rubbish to deal with. We had everything from used medical equipment through to empty tins of caviar. I've been going on expeditions for two decades. I've never been on an expedition that serves caviar. I'm going away with the wrong people. And when we were cleaning it up, we videoed it and we managed to get a videotape of cleaning it up back by hand to London, where it was shown on the night of the 1988 US presidential election. 10 million people saw footage of us trying to do something about an environmental situation a quarter of the way round the world from the UK. Of course now, over 20 years later, you don't need the media in that way to help you launch your idea. You can build a website in a day or two and you can outreach to a potential one billion people. I don't really want to talk any more about the cleanup now because I'm hoping that you're all sitting there and inside you're all bouncing up and down like Tigger because you've got an idea of what you want to go and do. But if time and money are the things that are stopping you, I would say that those two issues are issues that everyone who wants to think and do something differently has to face. <coughs> They're barriers to entry. Crack those two things and it will give you the confidence and the strength to demolish any other obstacle that stands in your way. If you think you're too young or you think you're too inexperienced, it's my belief that if you wait until you think you are experienced enough, then you'll be too late. And if it's the people around you that you don't feel that you're getting the support from, I would say you need to have the confidence to talk to everybody, everybody here at the Do Lectures, strangers, people on the train, people you meet in a bar. You've got to have the confidence to talk to them about your idea because you'll never ever know who your biggest supporters for your idea are going to be. Remember those builders that John Barry employed in North London to do the tower block? Well, a year later, and quite by chance, I found out that John didn't run an average renovation and building company. He didn't put scaffold up the sides of buildings. His company threw ropes down from the top and the builders abseiled down the building to do their work. It's the only company of its time in the late 80s that did this. And back then, the best builders to do that work weren't builders at all. They were mountaineers. And although I didn't know it when I went to that meeting in October 1987 in that basement flat, John had assembled the cream of British and American mountaineers to work on that building site with him. Folks, at the end of the day, we don't regret the things we tried at and we failed at. We regret the things, of course, we never attempted. And if the worst thing that can happen to us, if we try and fail, is that some people get to laugh at us, then I believe we have nothing to worry about at all. Thanks very much.